Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, and my sometime co-host, Ms. Purrington, is actually back home. We have a new co-host named Ms. Debbie, Ms. Debbie Ocean. More on her in a moment. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy. You can keep up with us on Twitter and Instagram at Comedy Wham or on our Comedy Wham Facebook page. In addition to podcasts, Comedy Wham brings you articles, album reviews, our monthly Comedy Wham showcase at Hops and Time in Lakeway, the next one is Tuesday, December 7th, and an events page for live shows in Austin and Houston. If you're a comic in those cities and want your show featured on the calendar, go to the events page and click Submit a Show to complete the short survey. Now let's get back to our podcast. Launched in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and will usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. And if you're listening and you like this podcast, please rate and review us. Now I get to introduce our guest. This is somebody that I have been very patiently waiting to interview for years, years I say. Uh, She was a 2019 FPIA finalist. That's the boring comedy part. Now, the really cool things that she's done that I remember her for are she's a proud burlesque dancer. I got to see her at a comedy seance, which I really miss in 2021, as Freddie Mercury, owning it. (laughs) She's a proud performer in wrestling matches, including Kat Ramzinski's brand new Woo show. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. I think I need more Woo on that. Uh, one of my favorite roles for her was as the spellbinding Valerie de Vaseline in Real Housewives of Austin. Not based on me at all, by the way. Uh, and a little known fact, she got to meet Zach Hansen. And we might just both cry when we talk about LaShonda Lester. She's the sweetest Austin comic co- contender, and now I'm so excited. Comedy Wham presents Roxy Castillo. Roxy, <laughs> Roxy, Roxy, Roxy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Valerie. I love this. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And just, um, you, you are here in my home today with my co host, Little Miss Debbie Ocean, yes. who we had to quarantine yeah. because she is. Um, <laughs> a toddler yeah (laughs) and would be eating everything right now but it's just such an honor to have you in my home and to just get to like talk yeah shoot the shit i know right yeah uh this is oh i just can't believe how long this i've been waiting for this uh i think i finally did a hard press to to try to get you on after seeing you at a Laugh Darn It show, yes, back in the days when we still had Rob Gagnon and Ariel Greenspoon in Ooh. our in our city, and they hosted this amazing show, Laugh Damn It. But then they did a Laugh Darn It version for kids, and uh, I had conned my son <laughs> into volunteering, and you went, you were like over the moon. In love with him because he was wearing a Hufflepuff shirt. Team Hufflepuff, baby. (laughs) And going all full circle, he was wearing a shirt that was custom designed by Matt Bearden's wife. Of course. (laughs) Who was doing, or who's doing, did the, does the posy, oh, pocket full of posy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you think about all the ways that people are connected in weird ways and so now whenever I talk about my son with you I'm like my little Hufflepuff and I know exactly what you mean where I'm like yeah you're a little Hufflepuff <laughs> who's not so little and the reason that I'm here in your home is he's debating virtually and he needed absolute silence in the house so I'm like hey Roxy might work out for you <laughs> you don't have to travel I love this though but I would have loved to see him and I remember that laugh darn it because um, we did the Laugh Damn It at Cap City, and then it eventually moved over to Barrel of Fun. They mm-hmm. started to do the kids' version. And I love the kids' version more because, like, adults are adults. Yeah. And little kids just were so into the idea of, like, oh, I'm not going to laugh. I'm laughing <laughs> now. And it's just, it's so fun to, like, make kids yeah. laugh. And then you feel like a rock star because you're like, yeah. Uh, she still got it. She can make kids laugh. <laughs> and the funny thing about that show is uh, watching comics try to stay clean. <laughs> and yeah. the, 
the uh, the easy target then is you go to lean in hard to the fart jokes mm -hmm. because you know you can you can get a laugh out of any kid with a fart joke. <laughs> Uh, I still use that for, like, my good sets, my adult <laughs> sets. Farts are funny. <laughs> they are. Well, Roxy, I do have an official icebreaker question, if yes. you're ready. All right. It is one word to describe your past. Oh, oh, tornado. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing a lot of, you know, quarantine um, in the pandemic has been a lot of self-reflection. Yeah. Because... It's the first time in a long time that I didn't have shows and that I didn't, because I do a lot of stuff. I do mm -hmm. stand up, I do comedy, which in my head, that's uh, improv and sketch, wrestling and burlesque. So for so many years, it, the, the 12 years I've been here in Austin, it's been go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time that I actually had to like sit with myself yeah. and to self reflect on. Why do I go so hard for things? Why do I, you know, say yes to everything? Why do I blah, 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 blah. So thinking about just kind of the the whirlwind, and I don't mean tornado in the fact that it was, like, destructive or, like, bad, but yeah. it just, I look back at past Roxy, and it just has been a whirlwind. Huh. Like, and it's been fun, but I'm just now getting used to stability and being able to like say no to things or to like have hard boundaries on my time and my passions and that I'm not just a performer and that I need to fill my personal cup up before I can pour into yeah. all of these different things that I enjoy. Yeah. Knowing the n number of things that you, you do did, I wondered like, how, how do you manage to stay that busy mm -hmm. and sane? <laughs> Uh, sane, <laughs> the, we don't, we don't describe Miss Roxy as sane. No, it, like, I just, I love being on stage. Like, period, end of story, yeah. you could throw anything at me. If it involves me being on stage, I, I love it. Yeah. That's where I shine. I'll do it. So it's not even like it was a, like, hard or a chore, because that 10 minutes on stage, that 20 minutes, 30, however long you get on stage. Yeah. It was, and it is so fulfilling that that gets me through to the next show, or that gets me through the like being tired at work. That gets me through the like, oh God, my book, my week is so booked. Um, but I guess right now, what I'm trying to figure out, or what are other things that make me feel that same joy yeah. and, and make me feel that so I'm not just running constantly. Sure. Um, yeah. So, ugh, am I like an adult now? <laughs> you might. Be. I wow. know. We'll, we'll, Gross. we'll uh, make a ruling at the end of this okay. podcast. <laughs> uh, tweet now at your <laughs> if you think I'm yeah. an adult or not. <laughs> so, going back into the way way back machine, where did you grow up? I grew up in Denver. Okay. In Denver proper, so the city of Denver, and. Fun childhood, very imaginative, very playful. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel blessed, I guess is the word, that I grew up in the time that I still remember having a home computer, but also a landline playing outside that, like, we didn't have handheld devices. So a lot of growing up was like, you go play outside yeah. or you check, you know, you delete the call from the school that said that you, that your kid, oh. you know, missed a period, you can delete that on the answering machine uh -huh. and it doesn't go to your mom's cell phone, that I didn't have a cell phone until, mm -hmm. like, high school. So just, there was a lot of room to, like, explore outside. So yeah. I was a very, like, active, outdoorsy child. Yeah. But not in, like, a, I didn't play soccer or, it was just, like, Roxy's somewhere in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. like, making trouble. Yeah, so. being creative. Yeah. And, yeah. It's it's so heartwarming to hear that you're you describe your childhood as as playful and creative because that's exactly how I would describe you today. Oh, uh, did comedy play any kind of role in your life growing up? I was always the class. Cl I'm hesitant to say like class clown because mm. it wasn't like I was making jokes, but I was always fearless in being outrageous. Like, I, I don't know how to describe it. I never cared what I wore. Everything was always mismatched. I didn't care, like, 
I don't know. I oh, I just sound like I'm. No, I'm gonna what? own. I'm own. gonna own. I didn't want to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. See, this is where yeah. the quarantine therapy is. I have to and redirect. I won't charge you either. Thank you so yes. much. But I I I dance to the beat of my own drum, and I think because of that, people just naturally found me like funny or yeah. entertaining because I didn't care if I made a fool of myself or I didn't care like if I was playing the loudest. And then, of course, it's as you get into, like, middle school and high school that those insecurities come in and you're like, oh, no, I'm too weird. Mm -hmm. How do I fit in? How do I this? And then it's like, no, little Roxy was the best. Like, she's the little light that comes out when I'm on stage of, like, who gives a fuck? (laughs) Who cares? So. Were you a teacher's pet? Because I imagine. Yes. Okay. All right. (laughs) Not even a teacher's pet, but, um... I just was... They would light up when they would see you walk in a room. <laughs> I got away with a lot. I'll just put that... I'll put it that way. I definitely got away with a lot. The, my grades weren't the best. I know I'm a smart person, but, uh-huh. like, I don't think academically I'm very bright that way. Yeah. But because I'm... I, I got away with a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Teacher's bet. It's so funny. I As you're talking about your childhood, I cannot stop thinking about that comedy seance when you were Freddie Mercury, because to me it encapsulated, encapsulates what you're describing. Like you just loved the attention. Mm -hmm. You put your heart into this performance that I saw you do and you had the crowd just roaring. That was... (laughs) (laughs) Well, I love, um, so I love Freddie Mercury. So the source material, like it was an honor to get to play him Mm -hmm. and, First off, it was always an honor. This is where the detour part comes in. Um, (laughs) To be asked to be part of that show. Because I think when I started in the Austin comedy scene, um, LaShonda took me under her wing. And it was kind of like uh, LaShonda and Maggie Mae were my big sisters. And I was kind of their like little tag along. That's how I saw myself. Probably no one else yeah. saw me that way, but that's how I felt, where I was just like, the cool girls let let me hang out with them today, and then I hung out with them. So I always saw myself like junior varsity to everybody's varsity. Mm-hmm. So that particular comedy seance, to be asked to do it, was where it was like, am I kind of like graduating a little bit from like freshman to sophomore or sophomore to junior, like if I'm thinking about it in those terms? Mm-hmm. And so I was so nervous but because I knew, because I knew Freddie Mercury so well, and I was like, I'm going to try this angle. I just had so much fun, and I think just being like, I'm already booked on the show. Okay, who do I have to impress? Like Matt Beard, you know. Like, yeah. there's all these people that I'm like, Mac Blake's going to be there, uh-huh. and Matt Bearden's going to be there. Oh no, what if they don't think I'm cool? Uh-huh. You know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, just being like, man, fuck. Yeah. Fuck them. I booked the show. I'm going to have fun. And it's also fun any show to have, like, that show in particular, um, like, Rob and Ariel were there. And they're, like, my, like, those are my people. Yeah. And so it just was nice to be, like, okay, I'm safe because my friends are here and they know and they support me. And, like, same with Vanessa where mm-hmm. it's, like, if one of my people's around, it's easier to be, like, okay, I got don't be so nervous. Yeah. So I wasn't nervous. So it was fun to like knock that one out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, we've now talked about this seance and I, I posted um, a week or so ago on my Facebook that I really miss the comedy seance. That is such a fun you know, show. It's, it was obviously gone last year during the COVID, but it hasn't come back this year. Mm-hmm. And it's a bummer because it was such a memorable, well done show, and you never knew what you were gonna yeah. get. And you know, I have, I have hopes that maybe it'll. It'll. Come I'm, back. I'm sure it will. Yeah, With, I hope so. I, there's so much that I'm like, well, once Cap is back, yeah. once Cap City's back, we'll get some yeah. of these like institution shows back. Yeah. But, but we have to find a new Satan, right? Because our Satan moved. Correct. So that's the big. I filled in as uh, Satan's assistant one year, uh, and okay. then Katie Pengra. The last year that we did the comedy seance, she did, like, a witch character. Yeah. So, well, you know, Satan's come and go. Maybe we got, (laughs) there's other, there's other satanic underworld demons that can sub in. So, going back, again, as, as school wound down for you, 
were you doing performance, formal performance at all, or were you still just being the the character crackpot in classes? Um, not really formally. So we moved from Denver to a suburb in middle school, high school. So that was a big hit to like my, mm. you know, being comfortable. Because I think a lot of that beginning magic was like, if I'm comfortable and supported is when that like sun shines through. Yeah. And so because I didn't have like the friends I grew up with in high school, I had a lot of anxiety. I had really bad panic attacks, then getting medicated for that. So that kind of, there was a little bit of time where like my shine wasn't as bright, but yeah. also like it's fucking middle school. So, you know, who's going to look back at that time right. fondly. <laughs> um, and then I got introduced to this little drug called marijuana. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And so a lot of my high school years were... Like, I was stoned. Hmm. And I, I had fun. Like, it was a ton of fun for me. But the things that, like, I regret not doing school plays. Or I regret hmm. not, like, I got cast in one school play. And then I ended up dropping out because I wanted to go get stoned with my friends and go to the Little Caesars in the Kmart. Because they would go there after school. And I'd be like, no, I have, pra- I have play practice. And I was like, fuck this play. Yeah. And then I'm like, man, oh, no, that would have been, like, a good outlet for me but I didn't really have that it wasn't until I did community college after high school and one of the classes well I should say so my uncle passed away when I was like a senior in high school he never had kids and so me my sister and my cousin got a pretty big inheritance Mm. so when I went to school I had the privilege and it was a privilege to get to take whatever classes that I wanted because it wasn't like I was on a track for anything or that I was like I could just kind of pick and choose what classes that I wanted to take so I took a lot of like drama classes writing classes and one of the drama classes that they offered was a comedy class Ah. so they taught improv sketch and stand up and then at the end of the semester they had this big um, showcase show so that's where I got introduced to like formal comedy and that's where my like comedy journey begins yeah that's when you switched from one high to the Ah, other and i still was stoned (laughs) i didn't switch we just added it (laughs) um yeah so i started that class and it was the community i had been looking for like the true commute like improv i love i love sketch so we learned all of like the basics and then for the um for like the big showcase show, you had to audition to do the stand up. Hmm. So we all had to write material and then audition that material and only two people got picked for the night of to do it. And guess who got picked? Roxy it Castillo. Was me. <laughs> and so part of like the homework was to go to open mics. Huh. So that was like my homework. So getting laughs in the real world. That was the first time that I was like, oh, oh, I'm good at something. Because I wasn't good at school and, like, you yeah. know, I was likable. But I, this was the first time that I could channel that into something. Mm-hmm. And I have a VHS somewhere of this performance of, like, yeah, my first live yeah. stand-up performance at this um, community college wow. of Denver. Scared Scriptless is what it was called. So <laughs> that's how I started my my little career wow well that's that's so cool to hear the connection from like your first official education was formal and then you've continued because i see you as somebody who's a jill of all trades like you can do stand-up you can do sketch you can do improv and to me it's like well she's been doing this all her life yeah kind of deal and it's because you got a little bit of a foundation of And it was nice that the foundation was technical. Mm -hmm. So, like, learning how to write stand-up, you know, like, in the class, it was, like, it was the formulaic, like, Mm. this is what a setup is, this is what a punchline is, whereas maybe people who are naturally funny, not saying I'm not naturally funny, but, like, they had to learn that on stage doing open mics, whereas I got that in the classroom setting to be, like, okay, let me look at my material. Is this the setup? Is this the punchline? Mm-hmm. Rules of three? Like, I, I'm i very appreciative that that's, like, the foundation of yeah. my 
creativity and writing in stand-up particularly. So from that point, where did you go? What did you do? Yeah, so I still lived in Denver. And after that, um, just kind of got started in the Denver comedy scene in 2008. Okay. And I was 19, 20 at the time. Just adore. Like, I was just the new girl on the Mm -hmm. street. Like, I don't even know how to describe it. (laughs) But, you know, she was out... She was out there doing shows, and it was fun for me because I was the new girl and because I was, like, somewhat funny. Oh. Um, yeah. So um, from there, what did you do? Yep. So I was still living in Denver, and then I just integrated myself into the Denver comedy scene, did open mics, started to book like shows they had just opened a Denver improv and I got to like um open for Joe Joe Coy oh wow (laughs) so I was like (laughs) and it was fun because I was the new girl you know I was cute I was new I was quirky so I like got booked you know I I I didn't go this sounds very cocky but it's my truth so it is what it is I didn't have to struggle I just got, I just started booking shows. So I don't feel like I ever had to like claw my way up a scene or like I started really strong in Denver. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm really grateful for that. But then when I moved to Austin, I did have to, it was a hard adjustment because then I was like, oh, I'm not just the cute girl anymore. I'm not just like the quirky, weird girl. (laughs) I actually have to like write and hustle and go out and... Yeah, so but I. You were still those things. You're still a cute girl. Yeah. You were still likable. I um, had to work so. harder to get booked for shows because that was something. Ego Roxy, we've had to mm-hmm. have many a tough conversations over the years where it's like, I don't want to ask to do shows. Mm. I want people to book me because yeah. they find me valuable. And then it's like, bitch, <laughs> just ask to do the show if you want. Like yeah. uh, Matt Bearden's Punch. For a long time, it was like, Matt hates me. He doesn't think I'm funny. He's never asked me to do it. I'm not funny. That's the show that's going to put me, you know, out there. And then it's like, I could have just asked him, but I was so intimidated by like Mm -hmm. these older people. So when I was in Denver, I, you know, you know, you're 20 years old. This is the first time that you're ever like socially accepted. You're not the weirdo. You're in it. You know, was I a little promiscuous? Yes, I was. Let's just, <laughs> let's call it uh, a spade, a spade. And you know what? I love 20s Roxy because she could get away with it. Uh-huh. And that's just the truth of it. So when I moved to Austin, I was like, I'm not going to sleep with anybody. I'm not going to like date comics. Mm-hmm. It's, it's comedy is creativity. And so because of that, I put this really big wall up in between the men of comedy. Mm. So I've always, I'm always just naturally more friendly, I think, with women. I feel more comfortable with women. Um, But when I first came here, like, I was very standoffish because I knew that I didn't want to get shows just because I had slept with somebody or be known for, you know, like, and that's not to... as a side, I know that I was funny. I know that I yeah. was valid, but I also just happened to, you know, yeah. you, you're just young. Like, Well, and you've made a change to a city, and you, I think it's natural to evaluate your wholeness yeah. and think, okay, is there are there things that I can leave behind? Are there things that I want to jump into? And you had gotten to a point where you wanted to make that change. Yeah. So when I got here, there were, like, the older kids, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the varsity guys that it's like, they were the ones running the shows, the Chris Cubises, the Matt Bearden's, the like, uh, Ramin Nazers, the Andy Ritchie's like that I just wouldn't approach. Mm. But then I also wasn't getting booked on shows because I wasn't being friendly with them, but I had had again that like, well, I don't want to be friendly because I don't want to... <laughs> Accidentally. Yeah, and you know, it's just like you're 22, yeah. you're 21. Like, we could pretend that that's not how scenes operate. Yeah. But, like, that's part of the fun of being part of, like, a scene is you were a weird kid in school. Now, all of a sudden, you have other weirdos with you. Yeah, you're going to hook up. Yeah. But I just knew that I didn't want to. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
quickly befriended like Lashanta, Maggie, Kat, Amber, um, Amber Bixby. So those were like my ladies. And so they kind of helped me navigate meeting the guys of the scene, um, like starting to get booked on shows. So going back to like the not asking to be on shows was because I was like, oh, well, they didn't ask me because they didn't know me and because I was so standoffish Mm -hmm. or because I, you know, really kept very clicky with like the she's and gays. Mm -hmm. Like that was my comfort zone. Yeah. So. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting because you're right. When I went out to comedy scenes, I didn't get to see you very often. And it probably was, that was a manifestation of of that. Yeah. Yeah way of life I guess Mm -hmm. so I was I was um so happy to see you at the FPIA finals I'm like yay because I know she does incredible character work incredible sketch improv work Mm -hmm. so it was nice to see you recognized you know whatever that means because we all know it's all judged and it's just kind of I I, I, I'm gonna take it I (laughs) earned no I you you kidding me yeah 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 Yeah. and that was like again going back to the like ego self for so long I was like I'm not worthy because I've never been a finalist Mm -hmm. I'm not worthy because I've never done this show I'm not worth and so I would just bring myself down when really like I'm almost actually glad that I didn't, my ego didn't get fed at that time because I think the monster could have been a lot worse. Mm. Whereas now it's like, no, I've earned that. I say this like, I'm good. Like, I'm good. And I, I, if I never do comedy again, I'm still good. Like, yeah. But I've worked hard for that. I've worked, I've put in my hours maybe elsewhere, maybe at the improv theater or doing sketches with Bad Example or in the wrestling ring or burlesque. Like, I've paid my dues and I just feel like now I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't like, (laughs) I'm so glad this is happening now when I can look back and to be like, no, that's just hard work. And I'm very proud of my like hard work. Yeah. This is the 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 three legged stool concept uh, put into play. The three legged stool being stand up, improv, and sketch. Mm-hmm. And my observation, I'm I don't own this observation, that if you can do all three, they each inform yes. the other and make you stronger. And I don't know if this will come off as an insult, but I don't view you as a comic. I view you as a character performer. Thank you. Yes. No, that's not an insult at all. <laughs> I think there's just so much more that you're capable of than just stand up mm-hmm. and all of those other things that you've been doing help make you stronger as as the stand up when you you know when we get lucky enough to to yeah. watch you do stand up so I I beat myself up for a very long time where I was like god could I have could I have maybe one FPIA if I would have just focused on stand up if I would yeah. have hustled and done this that and this could I have maybe made it to SNL if I had just focused on sketch. And so I was very hard on myself of like, why do you have to have so many interests? Why do you Mm. say yet? Like all of this now with like some years, it's a blessing, but I felt like I had punished myself for having multiple interests. Burlesque probably being the one, because when I first moved to Austin, started doing comedy again, kind of had that guard up. So I was, less like integrated into the scene. Then I found burlesque. So I had originally hosted for or auditioned for the troupe that I ended up being part of Black Widow Burlesque as their host. Cause I was like, it's a comedy thing. And I was like, for shits and giggles, I'll try to do like an actual routine, mm-hmm. you know, for this audition. They wanted me as a dancer. And so then all of a sudden I'm exploring that side of myself. So now I have these two creative outlets, one's using my voice and Mm -hmm. one's using my body. And I could channel some of that like sexual energy that I had maybe put into like actual other people into (laughs) myself and like learn how to feel empowered in my body. So because, okay, then now my legs are split. (laughs) But you know, it's like now my time is split in between like learning how to be a burlesque dancer and the community within burlesque is very different from a comedy community. Whereas, you know, the Austin scene has gone through many, my time here, many turns of the wheel. Mm -hmm. So there's times where it's very 
fractioned and clicky. There's times when it's super supportive. And that wheel just turns as people come and go, as, yeah. like, the scene evolves. I know that I'm just on the wheel. Like, there's going to be times that I'm not vibing with everybody. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be times that we're all supporting each other. Whereas burlesque, it's very supportive. Mm. That's the nature of burlesque. So then all of a sudden I was like, man, why do I want to hang out with these shitty guys <laughs> who are competitive and, yeah. you know, this ego base to go hang out with these beautiful, like, supportive women who all they want to do is lift you up and tell you how, like, powerful you are. So then I'm finding myself drawn more and more to burlesque, less to comedy, you know, then improv and stand-up get added into the fold, um, then you get the same supportiveness of burlesque, but with comedy. Mm -hmm. And they're always still trying to, like, keep my hand on stand-up because I do love, like, telling my story and being on stage and having the, like, sole focus on me. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But then here's stand-up and sketch where it's like, Oh, they just want to have, like, here's the goofy, here's the, like, but then stand-up looks down on improv, stand-up, yeah. you know, like, the historical, that, and so then it's like, oh, am I not getting booked shows because now I'm associated with this improv theater, or because I'm, um, I was in a sketch group called Bad Example, mm-hmm. and we performed at the New Movement Theater, and we were a weekly sketch show, so that took a lot of my time because we had to cr- produce new content weekly Mm -hmm. um but like it was vanessa gonzalez michael folk john buseman like all of these powerhouse people where we got to like learn this other form of comedy so that then took up a lot of my time so i always kind of feel like i come back to stand up but stand up's always like the anchor Mm -hmm. like stand up is where if those three legs that's the table that I can always come back and put my drink on. Yeah. So, yes, I started feeling the tornado, as you described, you know. <laughs> Please, the, the you get it. <laughs> stand-up, sketch, improv. Uh, what was the most intense period for you with your interests in these different arts? Oh, probably like 2016 to 2000. Mm. those four years it was just hard to say no then that's when wrestling gets added into the fold oh god yes yes (laughs) there's wrestling (laughs) which is its own beast already Uh um so then that gets folded in and it's just it's hard to say no like i i lived and died by my calendar where I would have all, you know, I'd look at my month and I'd be like, mm-hmm. can I squeeze in another? <laughs> I have this rehearsal. I have this practice. And honestly, I love the grind. Like, I do enjoy, I did enjoy it. Let me say that. Because yeah. right now, Roxy sitting in front of you, maybe that's not it anymore. <laughs> um, but it was hard. It's it's just hard to keep up. It's hard to be tired. But then I look back and I look at my personal life and it's like, yeah, no shit you couldn't keep a partner. Mm. No shit you couldn't, like... You know, I would just smoke weed and drink and, like, just to come down yeah. or, you know, like, not taking care of myself just physically and emotionally. And it's like, yeah, that was a hard time, too, because then trying to have, like, partners, trying to have, like, you know, my job, I've always felt lucky that my job has always just been, like, a means to an end. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a hard time just you know, you're growing, you're learning, yeah. you're trying to have it all. And then all of a sudden it's like the pandemic happened and it's like, Oh, I can't have it all. And that's okay. Like mm-hmm. that's okay. Yeah. So, so a lot of reflection during yes, yeah. the, the pandemic. And now that we're starting to come out of it, you're doing the wrestling. I've, um, so I used to do three wrestling things, and now I'm only doing one. Okay. I'm trying to just edit down to, like, what is a manageable... Yeah. Um, I don't dance for burlesque anymore, but I do host shows from time to time, so that's maybe, like, a three-time-a-year commitment. Mm-hmm. So, like, that's doable. Wrestling's every couple months, so, like, that's doable as well. Yeah. Um, I... Yeah. It's becoming more and more... Man, I'm I'm just trying to have very hard boundaries on like 
did I get everything else done for me to be a person first? Mm -hmm. Then I can add in shows, like, and not the other way around. Because my mental health has been hard fought and hard won. And, like, I'm I'm never not going to be me. So I have to remind myself that of... I'm like, okay, I stopped doing stand-up for a couple years. That doesn't mean I'm not a funny person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm not a bright person. And that doesn't mean I'm not a creative person. If three years time I choose to do that again, I trust that I'm going to just have something different to say. But like, I don't need to be that. Oh my God. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Younger Roxy, if you're listening, you did it, bitch. LaShonda, if you're listening, you did it, bitch. Because I never thought I'd say that. Because the ego monster of just like, I need to do shows. If I don't have shows booked, I'm not funny. If I don't have shows booked, I'm not creative. If I'm not running, 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 I'm not this. And then all of a sudden, it's been like, no, I'm a person first. And I can always come back to this. This is a outlet. It's not my life. Yeah. Uh, I got a little bit misty-eyed at hearing you talk about that turning it on myself so I have I I was doing stand-up for a little bit Mm -hmm. and with the pandemic and now my son's between swim schedule and debate I I can't I can't go to open mics yeah and before the pandemic I was able to go often enough that I'd get picked up on a show here or there and I'm like okay maybe this is you know this is working its its way out yeah and i have definitely had to fight those demons of you know what for the next year and a half i'm just not going to be able to do this Mm -hmm. and when i when he graduates i will have more free time and i can Mm -hmm. and reminding myself my first job is as a parent yeah and if I can raise the coolest, smartest Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff yes. then isn't that the most important thing? Because yeah. that's going to reflect on me way more than, you know, How, what, 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 what shows did you book or what? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. like, I'm right there with you. It, it's, I'm a, like, we're people first yeah. and I'm a, I'm a woman first. And it's like, I think about the goals that I want and yeah, like a, comedy is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't have a world that I'm not doing something creative. Mm -hmm. It's just coming to peace with like, there might be seasons for it. And I've like, I've just no, you know, I, I knew I didn't ever want to be like a road dog comic. Like I always just struggled with where was my place in comedy? Cause it's like, you think of what's the trajectory for a comic. Okay. You go on tour, you, you know, you, go to festivals, you put your name out there. Mm -hmm. My schedule wouldn't allow that because I'm doing so many things would be like, well, I can't do a festival because I have wrestling that weekend or I forgot about this. So I didn't, I didn't want to be a road dog that way. The other trajectory is moving to either LA, Chicago or New York. Mm -hmm. Neither of those cities are places that I want to be because there's other like I love swimming. I can't swim in Chicago the way that I can go to Barton Springs here and swim. Like, that's something that brings me a lot of joy. Same with, like, L.A. It's just culturally not where I want to be or who I, like, want to be. And that's not a dig at anybody who does decide. So then I kind of had to come to peace. And this was probably around the time that, like, LaShonda passed away, where it was just kind of me coming to terms with, like, what am I going to do with this? Like, what is... And so it's hard to say this, and that's not to say that blessings won't find their way to me. I'm a, I'm a hobby comedian. Like, I'm a hobby. Like, this is a creative outlet for me. Mm-hmm. It's not my job. And yeah. I don't think I ever want it to be my job because I would not want the stress of it. I'm always going to find a way to perform at work. Like, I can do training at work. I can be in front of people. Yeah. I can teach. I can, like, the thing that I want isn't an audience clapping it's just i like shining my light and i can do that so yeah Yeah. vote now for being an adult (laughs) text 91724 if roxy's an adult now i wish we would have talked like 
five years ago? Because you would have gotten very different answers where I'm like, I gotta be yeah. the best. I'm gonna be on SNL. I'm gonna reboot Mad TV. Uh-huh. I'm gonna well, have a podcast. This this is actually uh, interesting that you mention you know the your past version of yourself because what i want to ask you is so you've had this like imposed upon self-reflection because of the shutdown Mm -hmm. but you've had a lifetime of being in that tornado and just taking on new things so how will you make sure that you stay protective of your time and your you being the person that you're happy with and not getting swept back up yeah oh You know, let's talk in a year. (laughs) I, like, the calendar has always been the Holy Bible for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I have my calendar. preach, yes. You look at it, and you're like, what can I do? And I think just being so intentional with, like, okay, I have my D&D game night, so that's my Thursdays. Oh, my gosh. I don't like to book games on Thursday. Well, I, okay, so it's not actually technically D&D, it's vampires. (laughs) Okay. We play Vampire the Masquerade, if anybody. Okay. Has played it. So it's like Thursday night shows are off limits Uh unless, you know, it's from time, if it's a good show. Like, I don't mean to say it that way, but it's got to be worth the, you know, she's got to be worth the squeeze. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So Thursdays are blocked off. Um, In September, October, November, Monday night shows are off the books because it's Dancing with the Stars. And I love love Dancing with the Stars. So, like, that's my moment to be at home yeah. and to be on the couch. I got my cat. I want to watch my fucking ABC, uh-huh. Dancing with the Stars. So, Mondays and Thursdays are out. Okay, I need to work out, you know, like, can I work out after, you know. So, just, like, looking at my, yeah. just being harder about, like, no, you know what? I'll cancel Vampire's Night because someone offered a show. It's like, no, I actually get a lot of joy with being with my friends mm-hmm. and pretending like we're vampires. That brings me just as much joy as going on stage does. So yeah. um, calendar is just a little bit more blocked off mm-hmm. and just more intentional with my time. Yeah. What I like hearing about how y- that process that you just described is you're looking at it like months, you know, like a three months. And I think that's a really healthy way to protect that time and reinforce your habit. Mm-hmm. Because I know that if you just say, oh, you know, I'm just going to, I'll skip the Thursday yeah. night vampire night this week. Well, then if you're just looking at your calendar a week at a time, then it's easy to say, oh, well, I skipped last week. Yeah. I'll just go ahead and skip this coming week too because I got off for this thing. And mm-hmm. Why not? And uh, then it's easy to get swept back up. And I, like, for younger comics, I say book a show a week in advance. Do, like, yes. Yeah. That, like, when you have the time and the energy and, like, mm-hmm. hustle for it, 20s Roxy could do that sure. and had the same like or had more pliability could bounce back a little bit quicker mm-hmm. like for me it's like looking like when does the show start does it pay how close is it like these are all things that like i pardon me feel shitty like looking at but it's also like but i also i go to bed by 11 like i don't drink anymore yeah. i'm trying to like look at how much weed i smoke like i'm i'm trying to get health like mentally healthy yeah for whatever's next for me. So looking at those things, but like bookers, if you're listening, (laughs) book stuff out months in advance (laughs) and give all of the details in Mm -hmm. one. Like that's a pet peeve of mine when people book where it's just like, Hey, can you jump on a show next week? I'm like, (sighs) I have, I have limited. I like, I've tried to do it like, okay, I'm only doing four shows a month. However, that's peppered in. Once Mm -hmm. I hit four, I just can't like run the same way yeah. and then trying to be like, okay, well my, and wrestlers do this a lot where they're like my October, November, December books are open, book me. So then once they're booked, those books close. Mm-hmm. And so thinking about it like seasonally yeah. less than weekly. So I would love if bookers booked shows out months in advance. So then it's on the calendar. Yeah. You have priority okay, that's a Thursday, Vampires knows, hey, Roxy has a show that week, we're done there. Mm -hmm. Like, I just really love when people, like, respect that time and respect that, like, comedy's not my only thing. Yeah. And and as a planner, I know that I like to book my showcase, like, two months in advance. Yes, I love that. So one day when your Tuesdays are open again. Yes, (laughs) yeah. Of course, it's out in Lakeway, and, you Mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a little bit of a of a 
hike, but the one thing that's for sure, people of Lakeway are very generous with the tips. Hell so. yeah, of course they, yes. <laughs> yeah, and one, like, I I just, I love new experiences. Mm-hmm. I love, so it's like, yeah, new show, hell yeah. yeah. I'm so excited for, like, when Cap opens back up, where it's like, that's a new space, or that's yeah. like, a, what are new routines that yeah. we can build out? But I definitely feel old where I'm like, yeah, I'm excited for Cap to open, because it's around the corner. Yeah, <laughs> like, right? It's <laughs> such a big... Like, God damn, I'm old! <laughs> but Lashana used to, like... I know, I don't mean to, like, keep gripping on her. I had no, a dream about she's... her the other night, so she's Aww. been in my, like, atmosphere lately. Yeah. Um, but these are a lot of, like, lessons that I've learned from her. Because mm-hmm. she would go through, like, seasons where she'd be like, you know what, I'm taking the month off. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to book anything. I don't want to produce anything. And I'd be like, girl, what are you doing? No, you have to like book shows. And she'd be like, I'll book it when I'm, when I'm ready. Yeah. And so I would see her go through these, like, I'm just not in the mood. Yeah. And she still was the fucking queen. Like, and she still didn't have to like prove it. Yeah. So I'm just hoping that I don't have to like prove it. We're just like, yeah, I'm fine. I'll, I'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. You're fine. You'll get booked. And if you don't, it's a hobby. Right. <laughs> We're fine. My uh, my deep connection to LaShonda was that her son and mm-hmm. my Hufflepuff were, like, born within a few days. Yeah. You know, to the year and, and date. And we would talk mm. about that. And, you know, I miss getting to to talk to her around yeah. their birthday times. And I think about her, yeah. you know, every time his birthday comes around. Mm. And, you know, it was... Mr. Alex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so for for anybody that um that is listening that has no clue who LaShonda is, we we've got on our website a basically a from the archives podcast episode mm-hmm. and article and for I don't know how long cuz I'm a I'm too lazy and also I just want her to be like a reminder. She is like perpetually our yeah. from the archives cuz I want people to know who she she was and that she actually still has an influence in the scene mm-hmm. because people like you and others like remember her and what she represented for the scene. Yeah. And, you know, I, I assume cause I, you know, it was such a, a haze that night, but when she won FPIA, uh, I mean, everybody was just like a more deserving person and her set was so impeccable. Mm-hmm. And talking to her. So like on the other side of that, Going back to, like, the confidence of it, she just was like, I'm not going to be nervous because I know that this title isn't going to make or break. Yeah. That that, like, she was like, I'm not going to be nervous. I'm choosing not to be nervous because I know that I'm a bad bitch. And they can either give that to me or not. Mm -hmm. And I think not having the nerves and just being like, yeah, I booked the show. Moon Tower, like this past moon tower was my first like solo moon tower that I got to do. And I was so like leading up to it. I was like, Oh, what's my set going to be? I haven't really, you know, been doing show. Oh God. What if, and then like the night of, I was like, motherfucker, they booked me. Like they know what I can do. Mm -hmm. So why am I nervous? Who, who am I nervous for? (laughs) What is this? Like, I like Vanessa is my best friend. And we always talk about this where it's like, who is she for? She's not for anybody. Like, it serves nobody for me to be like in my head about stuff. Yeah. Like I know, I know what I can bring. And LaShonda showed us how to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, and she fought for us to be able to be like, no, you're funny. Stop yeah. it. Just because we're not funny the same way that other people are funny. Doesn't mean you're not. And like right. your people are out there. So I, I take a lot of that from her and I take a lot of the like, um, just like boundaries with time and boundaries with like, She was a mom first. She was a wife. Mm -hmm. She, like, her family came first. And then her passion project of We're True Hollywood Tales. Like, people didn't go to that show. It wasn't like it was sold out every week. Mm -hmm. But the amount of detail and love and care that she put into every single show, even if it was for six people at the Salvage Vanguard Theater, I am so happy that I got to even be part of that and it's just like uh, yeah i want people to know lashonda i want like i got the privilege of um co-hosting on 101x for a couple weeks this past year and it yeah. happened to be on her um death anniversary 
it felt so cool to be like, no, I'm talking about Lashana on air. Like, <laughs> nice. y'all remember, we're not letting her, mm-hmm. like, she's not gone. Yeah. She's not gone. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you did get your first moon tower. Yay. You just talked about how you had to put, you know, the hands <laughs> off to your, you getting into your brain mm-hmm. about what that mean. Uh, so did you allow yourself to have fun. I had the best time. <laughs> it was, uh, I think the only thing that made it not the best time was the um, pandemic anxieties yeah. where it's just, we've gone so long without being in a crowd. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden being downtown for three nights, mm-hmm. you know, four nights in sixth street downtown. Yeah. I think that was the only like nerve wracking thing. of just being like, am I being safe? Yeah. Am I being, I know I'm vaccinated. And yeah. I know it's all okay, but like it, it's just shaking off the like, oh no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I felt the same way, but I, you know, I kept my mask up. I'm vaccinated, yeah. but I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't risk bringing it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, oh, I'll just, you know. it's scary. Yeah. So I had a wonderful time. Everybody was so wonderful. It's just so good to like see comedy again yeah. and to, look at it again not through like an ego's eyes but through like a what are they doing there oh they're telling oh they're using their inflection here to mm-hmm. get to the punch there they tightened that here and like kind of doing the math behind it yeah it was really fun to watch like james adomian it was so fun to watch like dulce sloan like shane torres and be like mm-hmm. what are you doing oh oh that's <laughs> when are they laughing okay yeah 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 how do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I find myself, ever, you know, since my then time doing stand up mm-hmm. and being such a fan of stand up and watching so many comics. Now I find myself at the festivals. I'm studying. Yeah. I'm like, what is it they're, they're doing? Like my, my biggest revelation was I got to watch the small venue show that mm-hmm. Maria Bamford did oh, yeah. at the Parker jazz lounge. Mm-hmm. And I'm watching her and I'm like, this shouldn't work. It just shouldn't. But it does. It does. Mm-hmm. It's wild to see, yeah, like, to try to study it and break it apart and think these random words she's putting together, but just her delivery, and it's just wild that yeah. some people can pull off things that on paper are nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But on a stage with the practice and... And that's what's been hard for me during the pandemic, well, just forever, I think, because I think I'm a better performer than I am a writer. Mm. So when I'm not performing, I don't have that confidence. And when I'm not, where I'm just like, oh my God, my jokes suck. How come I can't write? How come this is like hard for me? And it's like, oh, because my process is I need to be on stage to be in the vibe, to be able to like find how this works. Because on paper, you're like, oh, this sucks. Like... (laughs) Yeah, my partner, he's not a comedian, but he's like a very talented and very funny guy. And I'll run stuff by him. And mm-hmm. he's like, what if you edited it this way? You know, uh-huh. like he's a better writer just in general. Yeah. So it's been nice to be like, what, yeah, what <laughs> how would you edit this? Because that is not intuitive to me. What's uh-huh. intuitive is getting on stage and being like, sparkle, sparkle, bitch. Not everybody has, uh-huh. but the writing part is what eludes me. Like, I struggle with yeah. writing. Yeah. And yet you had that formal education. You learned the principles. Oh, but I struggle. <laughs> it's hard because I'm like, this should be funny. <laughs> nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I make it work. I'm not going to overthink that today. It's a Saturday. Yeah. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. We're not yes. going to overthink today. <laughs> nah. No need to. Mm-hmm. No need to. Uh, let's see. Is there, do you want to talk about meeting Zach Hansen since I mentioned it in the. Oh yes. Because this also ties in with Lashonda. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) I work, um, I worked across, it was South by Southwest, uh, 2018. And I was working on the 10th floor across the street from the Belmont. And I knew that they were playing, but it was like a teacher's only type of like Mm. exclude, you know, like teachers come see Hanson and so on my lunch break I was like fuck it I'm gonna go see if I could try to get in so me and one of my other co-workers um they didn't cart us they didn't anything it was just like come on in let's see it <laughs> so Hanson then starts playing so then I get to like during the middle of my work day get to watch Hanson and then they did this like meet and greet 
over, you know, in like the inside room and we were trying to get in and I was like, I'm not going to meet him, whatever. So I was like, you know what, let me try going to the back alley. And all while doing this, I was kind of secretly praying to LaShonda and I was like, girl, if there's any way you can help me like meet Hanson, that'd be awesome. So I'm in the alley, like a fucking stalker (laughs) and they come out and we were like, hi. And they're like, we're so sorry. We have to run to this other show. And I was like, uh, I'm not going to be weird and like chase after them, whatever. So they're walking out of the alley. And then I see from Zach Hansen's back pocket. And I could have sworn, like, if there was a ghost there, it would have been LaShonda <laughs> going into his back pocket. Why did he have a $100 bill not in his wallet? It was just folded up. Oh, my gosh that came out of his pocket. And so I watched the money fall from his pocket. I run to the money and I was like, Zach, Zach. (laughs) So I'm running after him and I was like, I promise you I'm not crazy. You dropped this hundred dollars from outside of your pocket. And then he checks it and he was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And I was like, since I gave it back, can I just get a picture really quick? And he was like, of course you can. So we take the picture The rest of the guy, you know, Isaac and Taylor are already halfway up the block. And I was like, thank you so much. And he was like, thank you. And then I was like, I just met Zach. And then I had to go back to work. (laughs) But I, like, levitated. It was (laughs) such a, like, my prayer, LaShonda helped me pull that $100. Like, I should get that, like, drawn up or something. (laughs) Because I just see her ghost just like, uh-huh. I got you, bitch. Come, yeah. Come on. Get, go meet your boy. And her standing back just watching. Why? Yeah. Go on. Meet your little white boy. <laughs> oh, I can hear her saying. <laughs> exactly. Like, uh-huh. she was just with me that yeah. day. And there's, t- you know, I'm a big spiritualist. So it's like, she's not gone to me. Like, yeah. we get to hang out in my dreams. We get to like, yeah. you know. And that goes for all of my um, Halloween's tomorrow. It's like Dia de los Muertos, yeah. where it's like my people aren't gone; they're with me. They listen. Yeah, she's here. I was thinking it is so perfect that we're interviewing this weekend because I know how like spirituality and mm-hmm. and the crystals like mean such a big part of you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is perfect. That yeah, we're interviewing. it's um, I. I don't want to make fun of that stuff anymore because Mm -hmm. for a while I was like, Oh, what if I'm like branded as a witch? And like, Mm. it's like that, that stuff actually means something to me. So how do I like lightly and respectfully approach it without it being like, this is my brand. It's like, no, it actually is like a stuff that matters to me. So how do I keep that sacred? So, Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, you said we could talk next year, so I'm going to yes. put a reminder <laughs> that we'll revisit next year, see how good you are at uh, keeping that tornado at bay. <laughs> She's a little a little water spout now, but thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for having me, and thank, I'm glad we got to um, just have time to, like, connect. Yeah. It was weird to hear what came out. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to share with people? No, just that I'm uh, totally normal. <laughs> We haven't really talked very much about Debbie. Oh, she's a little demon bitch. <laughs> I love her more than anything. But that goes back to, like, I actually have time now to, like, care for a pet. and yeah. to I had rats for a while, but mm-hmm. their their lifespans are so short. So yeah. it's kind of like a, this is a commitment. So I'm like, I want to be a good person for my cats. Yeah. I want to be a good person so that when I get another little friend for her, I'm a stable, healthy yeah. person who can not be out all night, and I'm home to feed them. So yeah, yeah. And you could join the legions of people that post cat pictures on Hell Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's my people. Like <laughs> Hashtag Miss Prairie if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Roxy. Before we close out, I yes. have one more question for you. Yes. One more. Blah. One word to describe your future. Oh, fuck. That's not the word. <laughs> um, a chill. Yeah, no. Ugh. Ugh. God. <laughs> what is the word? I just see like a, like a calm forest. <laughs> yeah, just calm. I'm just looking for a little, it's the classic, like your twenties were crazy. 
then your 30s are like, yeah, can I just like chill out for mm-hmm. a minute? So porcelain. Porcelain? Yeah, because it's like uh-huh. smooth. Uh-huh. It's kind of shiny. It's a little delicate. Like you have to work at keeping it safe. Yeah. So porcelain. I think that's the first, uh, that's definitely the first time porcelain has ever been mentioned as a word. Yeah, it's porcelain. Good. It's good. And Debbie's going to play with my Yes, pen Debbie loves porcelain. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Well, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham! Presents Roxy Castillo. Uh, tell us where we can find you on social media and uh, yeah. upcoming shows and projects. You can find me on Instagram at Generic Thug. Twitter is Pugly Roxy. Um, I'm trying to get away from Facebook. Just, you know. Yeah. Um, but, Meta. Yep. And then outside of that, just um, I'm around. I'll live in Austin for forever, so <laughs> you'll see me. Good. Yay. Yay. Well, we hope you've enjoyed learning about how Roxy got to be the comedic genius that you heard today just as much as I have. This has been Comedy Wham Presents Roxy Castillo. I'm Valerie, and that's been funny. Thank you, Roxy. Thank you.